You may remain seated. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> o Savior, open my lips that I may declare your praise to those who are near and far. Lead me in the way of peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters of Christ Jesus, God's word before us tonight are words from Isaiah chapter 42, the 13th verse. You might be familiar with pictures like these. You might even have one in your home. Um, if you can't see it, they'll pick on those in the back. You probably could see it from better in the front row, but good Lutherans don't sit in the front, so we'll just forget about that. But you could see a picture of Jesus with the children. It sure is a comforting picture, isn't it? Maybe it makes you think of other depictions of Jesus. You go into the fellowship hall and look at just uh, the, the door as you come into the sanctuary right above the door. There's another picture of Jesus depicting him as a kind, gentle, thoughtful soul. You can see the love in his eyes. Maybe when you see a picture like this, you might even think of uh, pictures of Jesus as the good shepherd. You'll see him standing there holding that shepherd's crook and the little lamb in his hands. But this one here with Jesus with the little children, doesn't it call to mind to us words that Jesus said, uh, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I am the good shepherd. Come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. When believers look at that, we find such comfort. We find such peace. We find such satisfaction. But when most of the world looks at these pictures of Jesus, especially unbelievers, they'll look at him and they'll say, what a wimp, okay? Maybe there'll be all sorts of derogatory words, weak, shiftless, and the like. And they'll say, Christians, how can you have respect for a God, a Savior, who seems to be so meek, who seems to be so powerless? In fact, how could such a powerful God come and let himself die and be buried in a grave? In fact, it's the Apostle Paul who tells us in the New Testament that the unbelieving world looks at that and calls that foolishness, it calls it an offense. Is that how our Savior really is? Listen to the words of our text tonight from Isaiah 42, verse 13. The Lord will set out like a hero. Like a warrior, he will work himself into a frenzy. He will shout, yes, he will raise a war cry. He will be heroic against his enemies. It's fitting for us as we begin another Lenten season, and for many of us, there have been quite a few Lenten, Lenten seasons that we've been through. For me, this is number 57. It's fitting for us as we look at the work of Jesus and what he has done for us, that we see this situation for what it really is, a battle a war, a knock-down, drag-out, bloody battle. And as we follow the series of, uh, or of sermons this, this Lent and, and its theme, the Son of God goes forth to war, tonight we see God describe the promised warrior. As we look at Isaiah's description of the promised warrior, first of all, we're reminded that the battle clouds had been looming for a long time. Isaiah had in mind all the way back to when God created this world. 
And after six days, God looked at everything and saw that it was very good. It was perfect. He had created Adam and Eve in his own image, perfect and holy. And he placed them in the garden. He gave them one command. Do not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. You can eat from all of the other trees, but don't, don't eat from the one that's in the middle. And you and I, we know that account well, don't we? Adam and Eve both succumbed to the temptations of Satan, and they ate from that tree. Doesn't seem to be like a big deal, but was there devastation and destruction and sorrow and casualty that came after eating that fruit? God told them that if they ate from that fruit, they would surely die. But they didn't drop dead physically. That was something that was going to come many years later. But they did die on the spot. Deader than a doornail. They died spiritually. We see that from how they reacted. God comes walking into the garden and they hid from him. Thinking that the insanity, really, that can you really hide from the almighty, ever-present, all-knowing God? And then Adam and Eve, their pristine relationship that they had, they turned on one another. They even turned and pointed their finger at God. Talk about some devastation. Those were the effects of Satan's attack. Satan starting that war. And it continued to go on. It wasn't long after Adam, Adam and Eve had sinned, they had children. They had sons, Cain and Abel. And Cain murdered his own brother. Not long after all of these events happened in the Garden, garden of Eden. You go on with, uh, to, to after Adam and Eve died, not too long after that, you get to Noah. Noah and his family. Noah and the ark. Scripture tells us that at that time the earth was so corrupt. The earth was so full of sin. It was so evil that there were only eight believers left. Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. Very possibly at that time there may have been a billion people upon the planet. And only eight were God-fearing. The world had become so corrupt and so evil, so infected and devastated by sin, that God says, I'm going to destroy it. Everything and everyone except for Noah and his family. Battle clouds were looming. We see sins and effects through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And how sin separates from God. Sin, sin brings death. Sin brings dissension, unhappiness, death, crime. The list of sin and its effects and its disaster goes on and on and on. The battle clouds had been looming for a long time. But God had promised that that promised warrior and champion was coming. And what a champion that that hero, that warrior, had to be. When Adam and Eve had fallen into sin, God had made the promise to them. Actually, he was speaking to Satan and to Eve. He said to Eve and to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel might not sound like a real intense encounter there. But once again, listen to the words. God said that he was going to send a hero, a warrior, to come in to destroy the devil, to crush his head. You know, think about this for a minute. I don't think there's any one of you sitting out here in the pew tonight that likes snakes. In fact, my wife has had snakes in her house before we got married, and I was on the phone with her. That was actually kind of humorous to listen to that event going on. I was just glad that I wasn't there. I don't like snakes. In fact, I would not be, be sad in any stretch of the imagination if they went extinct. Okay? The serpent, Jesus, 
or our, our, our Heavenly Father said that he was going to send a warrior to crush the devil's head, to stomp his head, to crush his skull, to take every bit of life out of him. This wasn't being shot with a bird shot, with a gun, with a 357 revolver with bird shot in it. This wasn't being beaten to, with a stick. This was a, 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 a hard stomp and an immediate death blow. That's what the promised warrior was going to do. And this promised warrior, more powerful than any Navy SEAL or Army Ranger that we see in the military today. In fact, this warrior, the way God describes him, would make one of our Navy SEALs or Army Rangers look weaker than a lapdog. But it didn't always appear to be that way with that promised warrior and what he had, God had promised he was going to come to do. That promised warrior, that champion, that hero, he comes and his enemies arrest him. They bind him up. His own cohorts abandon him. One of his cohorts betrays him. Doesn't seem very powerful, does he? But think about this. Don't forget about it. We'll hear about it in the lessons coming up in Lent. When his enemies come to the garden to arrest this warrior, this hero, this champion, they say they don't know who he is. And so... They come in and they say, where is he? And the warrior says, I am he. And they fall to the ground. They faint and fall to the ground. They get up and ask that question again. I am he. And they fall again. Fifth time, they get up, they bind him, and they arrest him and they lead him off to trial. They did not take him. They did not overcome him. As he was taken and beaten and whipped, that wasn't their choice either. Nailed to the cross, hands and feet, crown of thorns put on his head. They didn't do that. Don't, do you get that from when they said, who are you? He knocks them down, renders them powerless, they don't take him, he willingly gives himself over. He demonstrates his power and says, okay, here we go. The warrior willingly submitted himself to the will of his heavenly father. The warrior willingly gave himself for the sins of all mankind. And what, a, and what a battle it was, okay? A battle that that warrior won. Once again, Isaiah reminds us that warrior, this promised warrior, will triumph. Have you figured out who that warrior is already? It's Jesus. Listen to the words of our text again. Isaiah says, like a warrior, he will work himself into a frenzy. He will shout, yes, he will raise a war cry. If you've studied anything in world history about battles in past history, even going, going back to the Civil War and thousands of years before that, how armies would work themselves up into frenzies and the battle cry and the things that they would do to get them psyched up and pumped up for battle and then go in and it seemed to be very often an advantage. When did our warrior, our champion, give that war cry? <clears throat> when did he work himself up into a frenzy? was there on the cross. He gave out a shout of triumph, and one of the very last few words he spoke 
in life. When we're told he cried out in a loud voice, it is finished. Now that might not seem like a lot. That might not seem to be really significant, but it is. Because there's a mouthful, there's an encyclopedia's worth of information and comfort in those words that Jesus cried out when he said, it is finished. Those words really were things that people back in that they used to, to, to put a stamp, that merchants put a stamp on the people who had, who had paid their bill, paid in full. Jesus was saying, it's done. It's paid, nothing more needs to be done. I've done it all. The victory is mine. And the victory is yours and mine through faith too. That's why Jesus himself tells us, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. What a warrior, what a champion. And in the next few weeks, we'll get to see once again all of the wonderful, powerful, valiant things that our warrior Jesus has done to secure heaven for us. And because he's done that, we can say together with King David in Psalm 4, when we lay down our heads at night, in peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, you alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. What peace and comfort that is. It's ours in the victory that our great warrior has secured for us. In his name, amen. Please stand. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please join me in singing the song of Mary. You can find it on page 57 in your hymn book. Joy. 